Okay, there I'm live. Welcome back, everybody. So we do have two external speakers. Um, I will introduce both of them. Um, first is I'm delighted to uh, welcome Sean Mooney uh, to an NHGRI council meeting. Uh, Sean joined NIH as the director of the Center, Center for Information Technology called CIT um, in mid-March. Uh, CIT is one of the 27 institutes and centers that make up the NIH. Um, as CIT director, Sean now oversees a roughly $400 million portfolio that includes a world-renowned supercomputer, a state-of-the-art network that enables researchers across NIH and around the world, cloud-based services that give researchers a cost-effective way to access data sets and advanced computational tools and services, and the latest IT collaboration tools to promote flexibility and productivity. CIT collaborates with the NIH intramural community in computational bioscience, engineering, informatics, and statistics. Additionally, CIT provides IT infrastructure and IT services to support all of NIH. Um, in fact, um, I would bet um, we probably never have had the CIT director ever come to an NHRI council meeting, because, and that is no disrespect because Sean's predecessors were great people who I worked with, but um, that was the old CIT. Um, Sean has been charged with making CIT more broadly relevant at NIH, intramural, extramural, and otherwise, as well as helping NIH re-architect our data science enterprise more broadly, something that he's certainly going to be doing in close partnership with the new NLM director once that person is recruited, and that's a very active recruitment right now, and also others at NIH, including Susan Gregaric, who came and talked to this council, I believe, last council meeting, so you got to know Susan, and Valentina, and others in our data science office, and me. So this is terrific that Sean, and you're going to hear from Sean how CIT is going to become relevant to all the councils at NIH, and this is why I wanted, um, excited that he's here, but I also wanted to get him in front of all of you as soon as I could. So Sean came to NIH from Seattle where Gail was sad when he left. He was professor of biomedical informatics and medical education at the University of Washington School of Medicine. In this role, he also served as the chief research information officer, interim director of the UW Institute for Medical Data Science, and director of informatics for the UW Institute of Translational Health Sciences. Sean's a fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics. He got a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and molecular biology from, yes, the University of Wisconsin, yay, on Wisconsin, my, my, my place of undergraduate uh, uh, training as well. He got his PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry from University of California, San Francisco, and he was the American Cancer Society John Peter Hoffman Fellow in the Department of Genetics and Stanford Medical Informatics. He actually trained in originally in chemistry and informatics and his research interests focus on leveraging computational cyber infrastructure and data science to enable discovery within biomedical research. In fact, on top of everything else, and it's not going to be what he's going to be talking about today, uh, Sean's going to launch his own research group within the intramural research program, and it's going to be hosted within NHGRI's intramural research program. So he's quickly grown to be a great friend and a good colleague uh, for me, certainly for Valentina and others at NHGRI. And we are delighted he's joining us here today so our council can get to know him as well. Sean. Awesome. Thank you so much for the really kind introduction. And I'm really honored and happy to be here presenting to you today. I'm looking so much forward to your feedback today between now and the next council meeting and maybe future meetings if I'm invited to come back and present updates. I'm going to talk to you about computing and the NIH. I'm new in this job. I've at about six months and two weeks. It is so hard to believe it's been that long. The NIH spends almost $2 billion a year on IT, we think. We're not <laughs> entirely sure. It's, there's uh, a lot of IT that happens in the extramural world. There's a lot of IT that happens in the ICs. There's a lot of enterprise IT that happens within CIT. And today, what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about kind of the platform what we're putting together, and hopefully get feedback from you on kind of the directions that, that we're, we're, go, we're going in. Let's see if this will work. You might need to advance the slides. We had a little bit of a technical issue. Of course, we have a technical issue presentation <laughs> that I give. Um, a little bit of a technical issue with my slides, but that's, that's, uh, uh, that's OK. OK, so um, 
You know, I, everybody, I think, recognizes that computational infrastructure has increased over the past two decades. It, the cost of that infrastructure has gone up. We have an NIH strategic plan that talks a lot about interoperability, fair data, things like that. All of that incurs new costs. And I think a lot, you know, some of the things that we kind of thought going in, like having common platforms, might things make things less expensive, easier to do. And I think that's not always been true. In the same token, we've also have increasing data resources, data resources within the NIH, as well as data resources, you know, within the intramural side of the NIH, as well as data resources in the extramural world. A lot of us touch, have been touching all of them most of our careers. And the cost for those resources are also going up. And now we have AI. And AI is getting very popular. Um, you probably all of your institutions, the NIH as well, I'll talk a little bit about this coming up, is also building secure platforms for doing foundational models, chat GPT, LLMs, et cetera. And that's also you know, creating new costs and new challenges. And I think the, the message I want to give is that all of these lines are kind of going up in terms of like how much cost and effort that we have to spend on computing. And, um, and I think that that's something that, that we really need to kind of think about as a biomedical research um, computing, you know, biomedical research community. So, um, so why am I here? So I want to talk, you know, a little bit about what we're doing, kind of what our strategy is and how we are, you know, where I'm at six months into this job. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, the siloing of resources and some of kind of the approaches that we're taking to think about that. And, um, and then hopefully, you know, I've got a kind of a road show and some of these slides come from this road show. Some of these slides are custom to you. Um, and, you know, in order to kind of help get feedback on how to advance science. I think I'm, I, you know, the previous director in my role was not a scientist. I'm a scientist, but I've also supported enterprise computing my whole career. And, um, and I'm hoping that that kind of bridge of both being a scientist and being a computing guy is going to be helpful here at the, uh, um, at the NIH. Okay, so um, over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to give an introduction to CIT, talk about, you know, more coordinated IT at the NIH um, and how we're addressing that. I'll talk about the cloud, always a popular subject given how much effort and expense we spend in building things in the cloud. And I'm going to also talk about this concept of cyber infrastructure. Cyber infrastructure is a term that came from the National Science Foundation. I like it. I use it. I'm going to continue to use it until someone tells me not to use it. Um, and I think it kind of th you think about all of those tools and platforms that all sort of interact to enable biomedicine. And I'll talk a little bit about our, stri our, our strategy and what's next. All right. Let's talk about the Center for Information Technology. This was formed in 1954 um, and really supported you know, computing research. Um, and today, we are almost 1,300 people budget of $450 million approximately, and um, support a lot of enterprise IT for the NIH and a lot of things that touch both the intramural research world and the extramural research world. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those briefly because I really want to focus on the researchy kind of things that we do. We do, a, I think, uh, have a portfolio of activity that I don't think is well appreciated across uh, both the NIH, both internally and externally in the external world. The reaction to, you know, you know what, to CIT from a lot of people has been, what's CIT? Um, and I think that that's something that hopefully I can change, um, uh, you know, in, in the role that I have now. So we support cloud. We support high-performance computing. We support applications, both business applications that support the NIH's function, but also some research applications. We support kind of generally research computing. Um, IAM, we support commons IDs. For those of you that are in the extramural world, we support employees at the NIH and their badging and getting into systems. Um, we support the NIH network. That's a significant effort of what we do. We support cyber infrastructure uh, in certain cases. Talked about that a bit. We support collaboration tools. And then, of course, we own and support cybersecurity for the NIH. All right. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about NIH's digital strategy. This is kind of the tool that I was brought when I got here. This was already completed. It was developed by Patty Brennan, the previous NLM director, and Andrea Norris, my, the previous predecessor for me. And a large kind of you know, what I would say normal NIH strategic planning process, where they brought committees, both internal and external, together and developed 
uh, a plan. And I'm, what I'm going to do is just very briefly kind of present a little bit about how this plan was thought about, say that I accept the plan, but also say that it's very high level. And it doesn't really talk operationally about how we actually solve problems. And I think those problems are really hard to solve. You can read it. Just Google the NIH digital strategy, and it'll show up. It's one of those public documents, just like all the others that are out there. And you can kind of go through this report. Um, but basically, what they did was formed a model where they framed four different areas, the extramural research world, the intramural clinical research world, the intramural basic research world, and NIH um, administration. And they made a number of recommendations to support that. These recommendations, I think, are probably pretty obvious. A common architecture to support data and computing in the future. Um, uh, being innovative in terms of the computing and the computing platforms that we support within the NIH and our infrastructure. Enabling uh, a technically competent workforce. That's a big deal. I think we spend a lot of time on data science and AI and you know, gen you know, building the a data science AI workforce within the NIH. I've heard a lot about efforts that we do there. The, the IT workforce has similar challenges. We are really struggling to bring in kind of the new generation of IT experts. The salaries, as you probably are all aware, are impressive in industry, and it's hard to keep people here with the kind of the, the gold rush of AI and, and you know, on all of the things that are happening in IT. And I, have, and I think all of you have probably seen the kinds of money that trainees can make if they go to Amazon or Microsoft or someone like that. Um, the pandemic, of course, changed everything. Um, and we need to be able to support working anywhere. And I think that was another recommendation. I think that's also very valid. And then finally, um, uh, supporting cyber cybersecurity, which is also a challenge because it is there's a ton of things that come to us from the federal government as a whole around cybersecurity. And we have to take a risk-based approach to make decisions about what to put resources into to support to support it here. And it is not inexpensive, and those decisions are hard. OK, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but in, in turn, internally within the NIH, we have governance. Um, I mentioned kind of our guiding strategies, the, the uh, NIH strategic plan, the strategic plan for data science, and this digital strategy that was published last year. And then we also have enterprise councils that support governance as well, an IT council. We have a scientific data council, a data science policy council, and a budget council that kind of helps with IT, that supports IT issues, and making sure that all of those $450 million gets renewed every year, and we support what we're supposed to support. Um, the first thing that I did was, um, you, it's interesting. CIT is the only IC without a, um, without a, uh, uh, a FACA committee, like you, like a, a council. We're the only one. And we, it's interestingly, CIT, IT is not in the core mission of the NIH. And I would argue that that, that is the one place you want to have an external advisory group coming in and telling you what to do. It's the place that's outside of your mission that's kind of critical to what you do. So we are creating one. Um, the first step of that, it takes years to create a council, a FACA committee. So the way that we started is we've worked with the director's office and created an advisory council for the director. We've identified people. It's going to be co-chaired by Atul Butte at UCSF and myself. And what we're going to do is use that to kick off bringing advice back to all of the kind of plans that I'm going to tell you now over the next, again, next 30 minutes or so. Um, this group is, it's not going to meet as formally as, as this group here, at least initially. We're going to meet a couple hours every quarter and kind of present the different aspects of what we do and get feedback. Everybody's very busy, but we're very happy to have a nice group of, you know, broad expertise in IT and IT computing for things that the NIH is interested in that'll come and give us feedback. And we'll, and during that process, we'll be developing, hopefully, if we get approved, a formal council that'll go forward. All right, um, very briefly, some of the things that we do in CIT that you may not be aware of, just to give you a kind of a sense of the scale of what we do, we support a network that is 4,300 miles uh, 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 big. Um, and that includes sites that are outside of the DC area, including um, a network to Rocky Mountain National Lab for NIAIDS and um, the uh, NIEHS in North Carolina and some other sites. A number of other parts of HHS use our network. Um, 
that was something that was a surprise to me. The network is incredibly important, and it all comes through NIH campus um, and supports real, I, I, I think, real large components of our national interest um, uh, within that. Um, and I should say, and we, yeah, we support about 4,500, uh, 45,000 staff, 700,000 uh, uh, visitors to the NIH across all of our buildings. And the kinds of equipment that support this are also impressive. 10, uh, 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 almost 10,000 wireless access points. IT also has a similar problem to what all of those other things I talked about earlier, networking about, around data and scaling, and that we have a wired network that forms all, that works all those buildings. You know, there's plugs here, et cetera. But we also have a wireless network that's growing. The wired network still exists. The wireless network is also growing, still exists. We also have a cell phone network that we support and, and have to pay for. That's also growing and still exists. And so all of these are kind of growing and you know, kind of see those challenges that, that, that come up. And there's a significant amount of security that's wrapped around all of this, as you might expect. Um, we also support collaboration. We initiated almost 2.5 million Zoom and Teams and WebEx calls over the last year. Um, and this has exploded since the pandemic. Um, but the amount of collaboration that we do using Office 365 and kind of all the tools that we sort of are using right here um, all come through CIT and the C things that CIT supports. And then I mentioned the supercomputing. We have a high-performance computer. It's called BioWolf. At one point, it was in the top 50, I think, of fastest supercomputers. It was the fastest supercomputer uh, focused on biomedical research. It's physical. It's here on, it's on the NIH campus supported a large number of research projects, including work in NHGRI. Um, and you might ask, why do we even need a supercomputer? When I was a graduate student at, at Stanford, um, or uh, maybe a little bit after, based on that, the fastest computer in the world was actually assistant professor. Fastest computer in the world was IBM Blue Gene. You probably remember IBM Blue Gene, right? If your kid has a PS5, seven PS5s do the same amount of calculations as IBM Blue Gene back then that cost $100 million. So why do we need supercomputers? Well, we need supercomputers for all of the reasons that you might expect. Computing is very, um, uh, computing needs for doing, you know, sequence analysis, as you know, all of that is very hard. And now we have generative AI, which is the, which is the impact of, is crazy. I just read about Tesla for building a $3 billion NVIDIA supercomputer in Texas to support their kind of generative AI and learning for the Tesla vehicles. $3 billion. Nuts. Anyway, um, BioWolf has 105,000 cores. It has about 1,000 GPUs. It's aging. needs to be supported. Um, and we need a strategy for high-performance computing. Um, the, the demand for it exceeds supply. This is only intramural researchers that use this um, and maybe some visitors. But the, it's saturated. It's, being, it's using all the time. It's being used now. Um, and the number of CPUs that are used and the number of publications that happen per year are also scaling. And so I think this is a very important part of the NIH community. It's something that we should be supporting. But it's not inexpensive. We've proposed about $10 million a year to refresh hardware. Um, and uh, there are some other issues with our data center that we need to also work through that are going to be um, a, you know, a challenge for the future. Um, and HGRI, so uh, 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 studies that come out of the intramural program uh, go through BioWolf and have produced uh, impactful papers and, um, and research. So I just really want to highlight that this is an important area, something that we, need, that, is, that we need to think about. So what we're thinking about in terms of the future is we think a lot about the cloud and being cloud smart and following the, NI, the federal government in terms of what they're interested in doing. We want to maintain those HPC investments for BioWolf, um, and we want to modernize. I haven't talked about business applications. I don't want to bore you too much. There's an enormous platform for business applications at the NIH. You're all probably familiar with ERA, submitting grants, grant reviews, and all that. But there's a ton of others that have platforms, data, everything that you might imagine. A lot of it's in the cloud. But some of those systems are, are antiquated. We built, for example, the timekeeping management system that's used almost throughout the, the entire HHS that is kind of an old school platform that needs to be modernized. Lots to do there. 
Um, and then, um, you know, we want to be able to support data and AI resources uh, securely. We want to be able to share confidential NIH secure information with things like ChatGPT or Llama or whatever tool it is that we want to use to be able to enable, um, to enable research. And we want to really think about IT to build an organizational structure for IT that will get us into the future. All right, let's talk a little bit about some, some science-y things. So cyber infrastructure. I think of cyber infrastructure as technology, data, all the things that kind of work together to enable the biomedical research community uh, globally. Everybody, all of the ICs contribute to various components of cyber infrastructure and fund various components of it. And, and the amount that NIH specifically, I sorry, that CIT specifically does, it's a relatively narrow focus, maybe 20% of the total expenditures that happen to support, uh, support um, uh, cyber infrastructure for the NIH. I work very closely with the Office of Di Data Science Strategy, Susan Gregarich. She presented, I think, here previously. I work very closely with the acting NLM director and will work with the future NLM director when they are named. And I work very closely with the office of the CIO. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about the CIO's office and their role in this as well. And then, of course, the, the folks within CIT. Um, we think about bare data all the time. And we think about all these kind of tools we see uh, uh, the, the NIH digital strategy is filled with it. We read in like RFAs for grants that support data. We see all of the kinds of things that we want to do to enable interoperability of data, enable us to be able to take, you know, controlled access data from multiple environments, bring it together to do analysis. We think about all of those things that kind of come up. Um, and, um, and I think we need to think at an enterprise level about that um, and, you know, really consider what those costs are of some of those tools that we put in place to be, to be able to enable that. The way that I like to think about this is little Lego building blocks. Um, I want to think about modularity. I think everybody has something to contribute, but I want that those things that we contribute to be modular, to work um, we, you know, within this ecosystem of, in, of environments. And I can give you some examples of things that are happening within the NIH that support that, but I, I can't solve every problem but that's something I really am hopeful that we think about that modularity and how we contribute to those services that we provide around, um, around IT. Um, and those blocks can support anything, everywhere from bioinformatics workflows to the components of cloud-based uh, infrastructure and data platforms, specialized computing like quantum computing, um, and LLMs, generative AI, and all the new kind of fancy advanced things that we're seeing um, coming along. A lot of this can be done in the cloud. And the NIH is very cloud smart. I would call it cloud forward, more cloud forward than any organization I've ever worked in. Um, and this is something that's a larger initiative within the federal government. Um, and from that, we have the STRIDES initiative. STRIDES was championed uh, and led out of ODSS. CIT manages STRIDES um, and it is a platform that is aligned with the, with the uh, strategic plan for data science and enables cost savings for accessing the cloud under a single umbrella in partnership with cloud vendors like Amazon, Microsoft, um, and uh, Google. And maybe you've used Strides before. I think a lot of folks in the extramural community use it and get that discount. Um, but there's also things that are growing out of Strides that are more collaborative that, that actually are kind of surprised to me in that it's not just a computing platform that you log into, it's also a way that, pe that, that researchers and others can collaborate and do build things that are more than the sum of the parts. Today, there's almost, we're approaching 350 million gigabytes of data within the STRIDES program and serving almost uh, 3,000 uh, or 2,500 uh, research programs. So it's a very, very big initiative now um, within the NIH and, um, and we have you know, realized more than $100 million in cost savings as if those investigators went up and just swiped their credit card to run, you know, basically off the shelf, uh, off the shelf uh, cloud. And we support basically every single kind of data type that you could possibly imagine within, biomed within biomedicine. The number of programs that leverage strides is impressive. It's basically a who's who of NIH programs. When I got into, when I first saw this slide, in fact, I don't think it's been updated. I looked at all the programs I participated in when I was at the University of Washington that I knew were in strides because we were a big strides user and none of them are here. So I, I think it's even bigger than what, what you see, um, uh, you know, what you see on this, uh, on this slide. 
But there are ways that we can actually leverage Stride to do more, to have broader impact. So for example, um, ODSS and CIT uh, have created Cloud Lab, which is a, um, a way that investigators, any of your investigators, anybody in the country who's NIH affiliated, can get $500 of credits and access to the cloud and access to training to learn how to use the cloud in the context of biomedicine. Those trainings actually came from collaboration amongst a number of idea state um, uh, uh, universities that were funded by ODSS, where they worked together to create those trainings about how to get onboarded into the cloud. So today, any investigator can fill out a little web form and they'll get granted access, they'll get $500 that they can spend. Uh, it's very easy to do. We have thousands of folks that have, that have joined up on this. Um, and there was a, bu a bunch of announcements that I made a couple of months ago to be able to enable, you know, rolling this out broadly to the extramural community. And this is a good way kind of to get folks into using the cloud. And we really want to leverage strides as a platform to continue to kind of build these sort of collaborative efforts. Okay. So here's some of the questions that we're asking. Again, feedback is great. I know that a big question that comes up when we talk about the cloud is cost. That's always an issue, and I think that's a very good conversation to have. I think the way that we do financing of like cloud-like, you know, cloud resources at universities vary from university to university, like the University of Washington, for example. We didn't play indirects in the cloud. Some universities, I think, do. Um, and you know how data centers on prem are funded within universities or research institutions sometimes are very transparent to grant grantees and sometimes are not. Um, and I think some of those very same kind of arguments are, can be made here at, within the NIH as well. Um, how do we support authorization to access to controlled access data sets? We're doing a lot of collection of data, eMERGE, all of us. Um, it, where we have data that can be linked to other data sets and we want to be able to very easily enable an investigator to get access to them. How do we do that um, in, a, in an easy way? And there's a lot of solutions that are out there that have been built. Um, you've probably heard of privacy prote protecting record linkage, where if you have two sets of identified data and you want to connect them together in a de-identified way, you can create a hashed, you know, a, a hashed linker to support them. Um, that's another area that we're sort of looking at of, of, of helping. And then I think also we want to figure out how to collaborate with ICs better on platforms that have been, that have emerged, no pun intended, within the different, um, you know, within the different platforms that, you know, different ICs that have kind of built and invested in data. There's Biodata Catalyst and NHLBI, Anvil, there's many of them. All right. We do have some effort in kind of building cyber infrastructure for clinical research data. I'm both, a, I, my, in my history, I've supported both basic science and clinical research, but there's a lot of activity, as you know, collecting data that, could, that I would call controlled access. It could be, you know, PHI, it could be clinical, like real world data, like EHR data, or like research collected data, like REDCap kind of data, or genomics data, where we have individualized genetic information about individuals. Um, and, you know, within the cloud data platforms that I mentioned, tons of these platforms that exist that are generalized that are then used to build these other things, Gen3, Terra, um, uh, Calvetica, uh, uh, Palantir Foundry, uh, SCIT has Bricks, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and, you know, all of these tools kind of are platforms that are standardized and leveraged uh, within the research, uh, you know, within the research community. And there's a huge industry now, huge-ish, um, industry and biomedicine for managing clinical data, like the enterprise kind of data sets of clinical data. We, I was, uh, be before I came to the NIH, I was a consultant for a nonprofit that had a data platform that included EHR data and genetic data and other things. And they had an RFP to like, you know, revise and refresh their platform for the future. And they got a ton of responses. There's a lot of industry out there kind of thinking about data and, and managing data better and making it more useful in the cloud. One of the things that we've uh, built and supported is the, the NIH Researcher Authentication Service, or RAS. Um, this is a common platform for authentication. It can be built out of tools. It's connected to authorization through dbGaP. Um, and RAS can enable you to basically take two data sets that are within these disparate platforms that are in the cloud. And if you have an investigator that's authorized, allowed to see data across both of them, like say genomes and two resources, Theoretically, leveraging RASC, 
you can create an environment in the cloud and have that investigator have access to only the data that they are authorized to have access to from the, you know, coming from those different platforms. And we've demonstrated this with, um, uh, uh, you know, demonstrated this within um, a couple of, demo of demonstration projects I'll talk about here in a second. Um, this all falls under the context of a workspace. So that's one of the things that we really kind of want to start communicating and thinking about. It's like, how do we do workspaces in the cloud? How do we manage data in the cloud? How do we support interoperability of that data in those workspaces? How do we, you know, how are we agnostic to the platforms of that industry that I mentioned, but also interoperable so that we can, you know, connect across them in an inexpensive way that, and one that's not going to make an external investigator outside of the NIH's head explode when they try to figure out like how to do, you know, all of these kind of complex cloudy <laughs> things. Um, so we have lack of interoperability. Um, we, uh, uh, we need to meet data standards that we talk about um, and we need to, you know, be able to connect multiple repositories, uh, very difficult to scale. Um, and so, you know, things that we're looking at are kind of, you know, the, the, the reflection of that is how do we, how do we enable that data analysis? How do we connect them together? Um, there's some examples of workspaces that just are, you're probably maybe familiar with. NIH Recover is one example. There's lots of things that come out of, of Anvil, for example. Um, there are many that are out there. Another example of a demonstration project um, that leverages um, dbGaP and SRA, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but basically uh, working with the Kids First project and working with the Undiagnosed Disease Network, we can bring data together in Cavatica for an analysis platform using that RAS authorization across two data sets. BRICS is our platform. We want to be able to support it. It's, it's widely used within the NIH internally, um, supports a lot of these similar things in the cloud, um, and is maintained by Matt McAuliffe's group, um, and he has scaled it up very, very nicely. Um, we're generally agnostic to platforms, but this is something that we really, you know, if someone needs a solution, we have it, it's off the shelf, it's free to use. Um, and there are a number of studies that are in BRICS, almost uh, 600 research studies, uh, more than 200,000 research participants, um, and uh, more than 200 publications that have come out of uh, data that's managed within um, within uh, BRICS. For example, one of the key pro projects that's within the within BRICS that we support is a TBI study called FITBER that's funded by DOD and the NCAA, I think, uh, looking at uh, uh, concussion assessment research, et cetera, et cetera. All right, how am I doing on time? Okay, 30 minutes. So I'm gonna, I'll give maybe five or 10 more minutes and we can have a discussion, I think that, that'll work. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about our strategy. So. Uh, I, th I think you've kind of seen where I want to head. Um, we want to, um, you know, hopefully help influence national <laughs> cyber infrastructure. Um, we can't solve every problem. Can't solve every problem. This is a big, complex space, but I'm hoping that we can find tools like those Legos that we can go after, that we can help make it easier, and, and also put in place the training that will also help su um, support that. And um, it's going to take a lot of partnerships to be able to do that. Um, and again, we already have demonstration of what things that we've done already. Um, and we'll widely be leveraging our cloud program to, to do this. Um, we already support cloud. I mentioned, talked about this. We already support authentication and authorization across cloud platforms with RAS. Um, that's something that's continuing to be worked on and evolving. Um, we are uh, supporting workspaces in some context. We want to think about scaling those workspaces up and making it more easier to use, more plug and play for investigators, but we do support them today. Um, and I mentioned BRICS, and I haven't talked about large language models, but we also are working, helping collaborate with the NIH community to create large language model environments as a service that are capable of sharing federal government confidential information with securely and also that are agnostic to platform. It's not just ChatGPT, it's not just Llama, it's not, but you know, where we can actually treat those AI tools also as Legos and kind of click them in so that investigators can use them. Things we could support, uh, analysis environments to bring authorized data sets together. And like, I'd love it to be able to spin something up in an automated way to say, hey, I wanna do analysis in the cloud. I, in, before I got here at the University of Washington, we worked on a number of extramurally funded coordinating center clinical research projects. All of them were working on 
environments to enable analysis of some sort on controlled access data, and all the solutions were different. Very common. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, another area, too, that we're kind of looking at is uh, clinical trial computer systems, you know, clinical trials that we do at the NIH, very decentralized. Much, uh, I think a lot of the things that you've seen at your universities around clinical research informatics, like you probably have a CTMS now, you have an enterprise EHR, you have, you know, connectivity, you have REDCap. A lot of that is, needs, to, is, I think, still needs some modernization here at the NIH. I think the NIH needs to catch up to what uh, universities have done. Um, we're, what are we not going to do? I, I just want to make sure that's very clear. We're not going to start owning data resources and national information resources. Um, that's the NLM. Uh, we're not going to build, um, you know, platforms that are domain or mission specific to the ICs, like a cancer platform. That'll be the seabed at, at, at the NCI. We're not going to run studies like genetic studies, for example. We can provide IT as a service to help those studies, but we're not, uh, you know, we're definitely an IT shop. We don't have a congressional appropriation. That's also important to note. We run off of services and taxes. We're about 60% a tap off of ICs, and about 40% of is a fee for service. Like people that put computers in our data center, we charge them money to do that. And so everything that I do is going to be probably a lot like your IT group that you have at your institution, where they're really you know, compensated to serve. Um, and I, you know, one thing I kind of want to, I just kind of want to mention, because this is something that I'm thinking about a lot, and it's going to be kind of a conversation to have over time. We talk a lot about data resources, and one of the things that I like to think about is the life cycle of data, and uh, the what I would call the maturity of an individual data resource. Like, how well does it leverage some of these computational platforms that I've mentioned? How well is its data that's within that platform fair? How well is it kind of achieving like what our goals what our goals are? And I think, um, I, and I you know we think sometimes think about like metrics. Metrics I, I don't I want to stay away from, but I love the idea of a maturity model, something that the clinical informatics world has given a gift to us. I really like maturity models. If you're familiar with the HIMS EHR maturity models. Um, and thinking about data resources in the same way of like having maturity. So this is something you'll probably hear me talk about uh, more and more um, in, in the future. All right, we have a newsletter coming. It's gonna be broad. It's gonna have a communication outside of the NIH. Uh, watch the CIT website, follow me on LinkedIn. Um, that's kind of the, everything that I put on LinkedIn is really important. Um, Cause I, and I'm, I filter a lot. I've made, since I turned my job, I put three LinkedIn posts, three of them. And, uh, and so it'll be very, very slow traffic so that, that, I, that folks, when they see it, it'll be important. Um, and then uh, I want to thank you for your time. I'd love to have a discussion um, and uh, talk more about kind of what we're, what we're thinking. I, I, I'm a little worried about over-promising. I, I, I really think that, that this is a hard problem. I know it's a hard problem. The universities have this problem, too. Research, other research institutions have this problem. I think. Um, we can't, we can't fix everything. But I think, you know, if we pick kind of certain things, just want to try to help, you know, investigators kind of get access to the latest technology. But, you know, if there are ways that we can kind of overcome barriers of why it's been expensive to implement these common tools, really want to try to help get, get us there. That's, I think that's kind of the big, you know, one of the big challenges that I, that really kind of makes me scratch my head. It's like we put all these things in place, and almost always when we make a presentation about them, like using the cloud, we're going to make an argument there's an ROI, there's a return on the investment, because it's going to be more efficient when you do it. And I think in practice that hasn't happened. Okay. So I'd be, I'd be happy to answer questions and then talk. Questions for Sean? While, while, while you're thinking of some, let me, let me point out a few things um, that just to push a point even harder. So think about some of the things he said. First of all, he has twice the staff of NHGRI in terms of sheer numbers, two-thirds the budget of NHGRI, but he doesn't have an appropriation. So everything at CIT, as you heard, is either a direct tap or a fee-for-service. So it's a whole different, but no extramural program, of course. So that's how almost his, the huge amounts of his money are going to salaries. So it's a very different organization than, 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 a, than a typical IC that brings up great challenges, but it also has a whole other set of responsibilities. So, questions? 
Tim. Uh, first of all, this is mind boggling. So thank you for taking this on. Um, you made a point at the end about the return on investment not being there. Could you elaborate more on that? Because that, that was what I wanted to ask about, and you just touched on I, I'd it. Say, I want to say not always there, and that yeah. was maybe a little bit of a glib comment, because sure. um, I don't have any specific examples to share today. But um, if, if we um, uh, put in place something, a, a technology, um, like, uh, you know, like using um, uh, shibboleth, you know, co your common IDs, uh, which we've done a lot at universities. You log into an email you probably use, a sing that same page you always see where you log into. Um, uh, when we've built in that sort of technology into, um, into uh, you know, data platforms that support biomedic bi biomedical research, it's not always more less expensive to maintain that after you've implemented than before, but that's almost always part of the conversation of why, you know, ar the argument about why we should do it. It's not the only reason why we should do it, but it's often one of them. And I don't think that that's always been true. So where I was kind of wondering is around a lot of the cloud resources, like how do you think about return on investment there versus, you know, on-prem type solutions or whatever else? Yeah, um, tough question. Um, we are um, spending a lot of effort moving to the cloud. The NIH has been right. doing this for a long time. It's more, um, like I said, more cloud smart. Um, I think it's a federal term. It's more cloud forward than other organizations I've worked in, like ERA, for example, is completely in the cloud. Um, and um, um, some things are still hard to do in the cloud. High performance computing, for example. Like the, the moment you start talking about doing um, uh, high performance computing in the cloud, you're immediately going to start looking at spreadsheets where you've got your on-prem costs, and this is how much it costs oh, yeah. us to buy a bunch of computers and put it in place and serve it, and then here's how much it'll cost we do it in the cloud, and the cloud numbers are often higher. Um, and so that's an ongoing conversation about how to support like high performance, um, high performance computing. Um, we have, um, um, I'm, while I'm talking, I'm trying to think of some examples I might give you on costs, and I don't have anything that I can share right now, but um, the, the cloud, ca calculations about whether the cloud is less expensive, more expensive, et cetera, are, are difficult. Yeah. It takes, um, uh, it is, uh, in terms of the efficiency and the gains that we get out of the cloud of uh, providing services that can be used you know, broadly, not having data centers, not having data center footprints in space, which are hard to maintain in buildings and facilities, like all of that has benefits. It might be interesting to think about maybe as you learn putting out, you know, maybe best practices or examples, you know, because I think thinking about it from the university side, I think every university is inventing their own way to do it, doing those same calculations a totally different way. And, and it might be yeah, that could be an interesting opportunity for sort of NIH leadership in how research computing, clinical computing, et cetera, could be structured in the next several years. Thank you. I, I, I don't want to get too much in trouble or ahead of myself here, yeah. but I think we re really want to, that newsletter that I mentioned, we really want to play an influential role mm -hmm. in helping research institutions think about how they make investments in research computing. I think we, over the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen a trend where there was universities had tons of investments in research computing. Then enterprise systems like email, et cetera, you know, transformational projects to you know, build a business system that is you know, a single enterprise business system, build a single enterprise EHR for your medical school, build a single enterprise email system, um, which you know, most places have done. That's distracted IT a lot mm -hmm. from research computing. And a lot of research computing places are funded by the NIH um, and, and are soft funded off of, off of grants. My mm -hmm. shop was largely yeah. soft funded. And, um, and so, um, but you're starting to see more investments in research computing today within universities. A lot mm -hmm. of AI efforts that are happening, enabling a access to AI. A lot of, um, um, uh, uh, we're seeing a growth in high performance computing again. <laughs> Um, seen also support for cloud, the cloud within universities that are solely research focused. Um, and if there's a way that we might be able to be helpful in influencing that, I, I'd love, I, that would be great. Thank you. Other, so I'll, Sean, maybe one of the things that um, you could say a few comments on, and I realize this is absolutely uh, describing how you're building the airplane as we are all trying to fly it with you. 
is um, this more um, orchestrated, coordinated vision around the data ecosystem that in particular you and Susan Gregerich's office yeah. out of the office of director and the new NLM director will help design and implement, but then bringing along with it lots of offices, including and lots of, uh, lots of institutes um, and centers and components within those. So I just, we, Sean and I both served on the search committee for the new LN director. I was the chair, he was a member. We can't really talk about the details, but it is moving along quite nicely. And that person will hopefully be on board within you know, some number of months. Um, and then you, you're gonna, you and Susan then pick up a third partner, as part, but at a high level, but then of course there's also then reaching out to people like Valentina who represents data science for our institute and others. I'm, I'm just curious, you're starting to build that ecosystem. You yeah. touched on some of yeah, that. So but what, maybe just fill out a little bit more how that's actually gonna happen because it really, under Monica's vision and leadership and bringing Sean here, really sees a whole different way all this is gonna happen than just 28 different ways, which is the way it used to be. There's a lot to talk about today. One thing that I haven't talked a lot about is the office of the CIO. Um, NIH has a CIO, it's in the director's office. We have a ongoing CIO search. Uh, we have an, uh, someone in an acting role today. Um, and the uh, CIO provides, CIT is very operational. CIO provides a coordinating function across the ICs, convening function, bringing together uh, you know, leaders in networking that support the NIH's community of networking, data, um, operational AI. Um, and other things. Maybe I'll talk about operational AI here in a second. And um, I've, I've taken, a, so I've taken a new role as well that I kind of soft launch, haven't talked about in the director's office, overseeing the office of the CIO to help kind of with some of these coordination activities to make sure that with IT, we're really coordinating what we do and bringing the right people together to do that. Now, in terms of data resources, I'm, I, I, we're, we're I'm working very closely with um, this, with the CIO, with uh, the NLM lead, and with Susan Gregerich and myself to think about da data resources, what we spend, what that, life, what that life cycle is of data resources, and how do, we, um, how do we think about how we build them, how we support them over time, how we sunset them, how we govern them, all of those kind of questions are happening. And, and what is, a, what is a, you know, a strategic resource within the NIH? And how do, we, how do we support them in the future? I don't really have too much to say on that, but I just it's a conversation that I, we can come back. Maybe Susan or myself can come back and talk more about. But there are efforts to really think about these data resources. Because personally, from my view, I think the cost of data, uh, cost of IT, now the cost of AI are Re, you know, all going up and are all being kind of additionally kind of asked and we build new data resources, but we still maintain the ones we already have. Um, and that's a, 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 a big challenge. I also think, so I'll get on my soapbox a little bit here. This is probably the only soapbox I'll get on today, but I think it's really important. I think we've kind of entered a new era and I don't think the research community has really figured it out yet. And, and to be totally honest, you can get on my case about this later. And that is where we've entered this era of operational AI. AI is now getting put in place in production, sometimes without the involvement of a data scientist. Healthcare systems are putting in like drafting inbox messages for patients, uh, ambient uh, uh, note takers that are gonna record a visit and put in documentation. Um, uh, you know, we have these Zoom things that join Zoom and take minutes for us. Like we're putting operational, real true AI <coughs> in place operationally. And it's for the first time, it's separate from a researcher in my view, because historically, if AI was put in place, usually there was a data science, computer scientist or an informatics person that was like driving that forward. That's not true today, and it's gonna continue that way. And so I think we need to kind of rethink about like how we support these systems. We have hundreds, hundreds, more than 100 operational real AI systems at the NIH that are operational, not research, operational. And, um, and uh, it's the same in institutions. And I, I think as researchers too, we need to think about how we how we think about how we do research on AI, because it's there now, and it's gonna be producing and doing things that I think we should think about. Anyway, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox, but I think that's a, something we should all think about in terms of computational infrastructure. 
I was just curious, <clears throat> for, for a researcher, uh, for example, at NHGRI, when they do their compute, are they using a local uh, high-performance server or are they using a cloud? Great, so great question. So um, uh, there's, um, uh, uh, I'll tell you my view on the ecosystem and then everybody in the room can correct me on that. Um, again, it's an ecosystem. It's not just one thing, right? So we have BioWolf on campus, the IRP, the Intramural Research Program of NHGRI leverages that heavily and, um, and are big proponents of us doing our refresh and investments of getting the hardware you know, modernized as we, you know, as, as hardware kind of gets out of its life cycle, getting new hardware in place to be able to, to, to do that. They're also workspace kind of, plat the platformy things that I talked about, like Anvil, like you're probably all familiar with NHGRI's Anvil, it's in the cloud, you can do analysis on that, um, and their workflows on that, things like that, that's also heavily leveraged by, you know, all parts of the NHGRI community. And then there are, um, you know, kind of a, a tail of other platforms that, uh, there, of which there are many that kind of help support, um, uh, you know, research that, that happens. As you see, I had a follow-up question. As, as you see, the need will continue to increase for, you know, compute. And uh, <clears throat> how do you foresee planning for that? And then... <clears throat> we we could... Yeah. And just a quick question, yeah. uh, follow-up is, are there any discussions of the impact on... I like the energy footprint of all of this. Yes. Um, I, I, so the energy, that's something, um, the environmental effects of AI are something that we think about a lot. Um, uh, I don't have really anything else to talk about in terms of that, but it's definitely something that's being considered. Um, the, um, what I worry about in terms of computing is uh, uh, specialized hardware like GPUs. Um, you know, NVIDIA, AMD, other, you know, these large companies are building these, these things that started as, you know, video game graphics processors that now don't even have a monitor port on them anymore, that you put into a computer and they cost, you know, 10000 or more dollars each. We're competing with the rest of the AI world for that hardware. And um, it's right now is very, very expensive. Uh, look, at, look at NVIDIA's stock to get a kind of an example of how much is happening. I mentioned that, that Tesla's built a $3 billion, that was just my calculation, I don't know if that's exactly true, but a $3 billion data center supercomputer and um, the big cloud, you know, cloud environments as well, buying lots of that hardware to provide as a service and we compete for that. And I'm, I'm worried about those costs to, to enable biomedical research. Uh, Sean, I have a question. So there are a number of programs and initiatives across the NIH that focus on some aspects of AI, methods development, applications of AI, and so on and so forth. Lots of initiatives, some are common funds, some in DOD, and so on. So what is the role of CIT in all of it um, compared to a DSS role? Where, where do you see the leadership and the priority settings coming yeah. from? I, I only had one slide on governance. My roadshow has about six, and I took it out so I wouldn't overwhelm you all with go with governance. Go governance within for IT at the NIH is is um, has a lot of you know things that we could think about for the future that I think could improve it. Um, there are multiple committees that make governance decisions about budget, like what we fund um, and what we invest in what we invest in. Um, in terms of IT. There's also all, the individual ICs do their, you know, some of them uh, 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 do things completely independently. But in, in terms of enterprise IT, there are multiple councils that make decisions about budget. And sometimes, for example, someone will fund a new project that has out year costs, like maintenance costs in the future that are non-trivial. And the folks that oversee maintenance costs didn't even know that that project was funded. And so that's a that's something that we're going to think about uh, over the future is how to build a more integrated or even centralized IT governance. That's, that's going to have to go through all of the processes to make that happen, but that's something that I think we should consider. So that, and that includes AI plat platforms. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. I re really, really appreciate your time. Thank you.